welcome all of you here this afternoon. My name is Karin Mogg. I'm the director here of the Meter Center for Calvin Studies. And it is the Meter Center that is hosting today's special lecture. And we are delighted to welcome as our spring lecturer, Dr. Jeff Fisher. He is Associate Professor of Theological Studies at Kuiper College, just up the belt line from here. And he's also Academic Dean at Kuiper College, a position that he began in 2017. And you can imagine these are very busy days for academic deans and all administrators of every kind, so we're very glad, Jeff, that you took the time to join us today in what must be a very hectic period for you. Jeff was ordained to the ministry in the CRC in, in 2004. He has his THM from Calvin Theological Seminary and his PhD from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He obtained that in 2013. He is working on editing a volume for the Reformation Commentary on Scripture series, which is going to be, which is being published by InterVarsity Press. And he's working on the volume on Isaiah, which is another huge undertaking. He is a specialist on the Swiss reformer Johannes Ecolampadius, and he has a 2016 publication, a volume on Johannes Ecolampadius on Hebrews, for the Refo 500 series published by Van den Hoek and Ruprecht. And today's presentation for us is again on Johannes Ecolampadius and on Johannes Ecolampadius' Christoscopic view of the covenant. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fisher. Thank you. Thanks, Kareem. Uh, thanks to the Meter Center for inviting me to present on this often overlooked reformer, Johannes Ecolampadius. You'll actually hear me say it a few different ways. Ocolampadius, Ecolampadius, Ocolampadius. Uh, as I explained how he got his name, really it should be Oikolampadius, um, but that sounds even weirder than uh, the other pronunciations of it. Um, so, as Karine said, what I want to do this morning is, or this morning, we are really confused at this point now, this afternoon, is focus on Ocolampadius' contribution to the development of the covenant, the reformed understanding of the covenant, and explain a little bit about my term Christoscopic uh, that I've used here. Um, but I anticipate that many of you don't have the life details of Ocolampadius in your mind and in your head and how he fits into the Reformation. So I've, I've organized uh, this afternoon's presentation around kind of three main categories. The, we'll spend the most time in the third one, highlighting a little bit of Ocolampadius' life and ministry, uh, talk briefly about what I mean by his Christoscopic approach to interpreting scripture, and then uh, focus on Ocolampadius and reform views on the covenant. Um, so first of all, Ocolampadius' life, um, he is a con he's considered a significant uh, reformer at the time. Uh, you don't hear a lot about him or read a lot about him anymore. Uh, you can find some things about him in dictionaries and encyclopedia entries, depending on the dictionary that you look at. Some of them don't include him at all. Uh, but there's very little, actually, that's been written about him in English. Um, his, the definitive biography is actually in German, um, and then other resources, short articles and things like that, are really all that's out there about him. Um, so I started doing my dissertation work at Trinity uh, on uh, Ecolampadius and looking particularly at his work on Hebrews, and so this comes out of some of that work as well. Um, Ecolampadius is highly regarded well into the 17th century. Um, so this is just one evidence of this. This is a painting um, by an unknown artist back in the, in the 17th century, and you can probably identify a few of these faces. You probably all know who this guy is right here in the middle, right? <laughs> Hopefully you recognize that's John Calvin. Next to him, Martin Luther, Jan Hus, John Wycliffe, Ulrich Zwingli up there, and Philip Lincoln's there in the corner. Um, up here in the top right is John or Johannes Ecolampadius. Um, so he's among, in the 17th century, he's among these like top, whatever this is, 15 reformers and theologians. Uh, so a little bit about his life. Ecolampadius was born in 1482 in, in you know, what will become the nation of Germany in Weinsberg. Uh, if you are keeping track of dates of other reformers, this is a year before Martin Luther. So Ecolampadius and Luther are very, very close contemporaries in age and what they, uh, and what they do and the time frame of it. His German name, his given name, is actually Johannes Huskin. Uh, there's actually a variety of spellings, even in some of the primary sources, of how uh, his, his surname was written. Uh, as a result of his involvement in the humanist movement, he actually takes on this 
uh, Latinized form of the Greek equivalent, you see us here, oiko lumpad, for those of you who have learned a little Greek, of a version of his German name, Hausschein. So oiko lumpad is really, in English, we would say house lamp. And so that's, that's how he took on this name that he becomes uh, familiar with throughout the uh, 16th century. Uh, his education from about 1499 to 1518 at some of the top schools of the day, especially humanist schools of the day, Heidelberg, Tübingen, Stuttgart, and Basel. Uh, he becomes a, a good friend of Philip Melanchthon, particularly at uh, their time in Tübingen. Nachman Pontius is quite a bit older than Melanchthon and becomes kind of a father figure mentor to Melanchthon, and the two of them will have quite a few interactions uh, later in Akhilin Padius' life, particularly over the Lord's Supper. By 1510, Akhilin Padius is ordained as a Roman Catholic priest. Um, so he is Catholic, and he's uh, very involved in church ministry. Um, he first moves to Basel in, in 1515. Um, he is working, after working with uh, Johannes Reuschlin on Hebrew, uh, he is considered a homo trilinguist, a person who is skilled in all three biblical languages, all three of the languages that the scriptures uh, are used at the time, Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. Um, while those of you doing seminary and this stuff, you know, that's Hebrew and Greek is required. Um, this is actually pretty rare at the time, and, and some of you know about this. Um, he, the, the Christian Hebraist movement is actually controversial that some of the, the Christian humanists are learning the language of Hebrew. Akhlon Padius actually becomes somewhat of an expert in these languages in Greek and Hebrew. And that brings him to Basel in 1515 uh, to work with Erasmus on the first published Greek New Testament, uh, what will be called the Novum Instrumentum in 1516. Uh, Akhlon Padius, one of his key roles in the first published Greek New Testament uh, is to be the old, what I call the Old Testament editor, the word there is actually castigator, uh, the Old Testament editor of this Greek New Testament, one of his primary responsibilities was to look at all of the New Testament passages that use the Old Testament and provide notes and comments on that and ensure that they were translated properly. Uh, so that's a, a key uh, event in his life. Um, I've written an article and done presentations on his role in the, in the first published New Testament, so you can go find that. I think it's in the Journal of Early Modern Christianity. In 1518, he gets his Doctorate of Divinity from Basel, uh, and he so now he's an ordained Catholic priest with a doctorate. Uh, this is He's a pretty substantial guy. Um, at this time, he's actually given the opportunity and an invitation to teach at Wittenberg. So again, if you know some of this story, Luther is at Wittenberg, um, and so he, he could have had an opportunity to be teaching with Luther. Instead, he does not do that. He's also invited uh, to work again with Erasmus on the second edition of the Greek New Testament. Uh, he actually declines both of those and instead focuses on and becomes the confessor priest at, priest at the cathedral in Basel. Um, so again, a substantial ministry role that he has. While there, he also completes his own Greek grammar so he's a priest, and he's doing uh, writing a Greek grammar, and he's translating patristics. Uh, he starts his career as a patristic scholar, which will actually have an impact on the way he uh, reads and interprets scripture. He translates Chrysostom, Cyril of Alexandria, Gregory Nazianzus, and many others, particularly, interestingly, those from the Eastern tradition. Uh, around the summer of 1519, uh, he has a, what's called his breakthrough to the Reformation. We don't have specific evidence, or he didn't really refer anything to, like, here's the point where I went from Roman Catholic to Protestant. Um, it seems like it was kind of a gradual thing as he started gaining more familiarity with some of the teachings of Lutheran and others around him, particularly as he's in Augsburg, um, after he moves from Basel, he's aligning himself more with these Luther sympathizers and beginning to uh, take on some of their views and not hold to the traditional views that are being taught in the Roman Catholic Church. Most likely because of this, uh, in April 1520, he goes into a monastery. Uh, I think he, he's, he's at a point where he's trying to figure out his own views, he's trying to deal with the things that are happening around him, 
Uh, and he goes into a monastery, and because he's a thinker and a writer, he starts writing things. He writes on the Lord's Supper. He writes on the Virgin Mary. He writes on the, the practice of confession, which for the Roman Catholics was a sacrament. And he starts writing on Luther and Luther's teachings, um, which don't go over well in a Catholic monastery. Uh, and so because he really can't avoid engaging in these things, he's actually forced to flee this monastery uh, after he's been there for about a year and a half. And so 1522, he makes his way to Basel again uh, for the third time. And there, he begins a friendship with Zwingli, who's in Zurich at the time. And so this actually is quite influential on uh, Aquilampadius' career and the direction that he goes is this relationship he has with Zwingli. When he's there, so he's a Rome, he's a Catholic priest who's really kind of abandoned the Catholic tradition. He's in a place that's somewhat Catholic and is working to embrace some reform teachings. They don't actually embrace the Reformation uh, ordinances until 1529, but he is given an opportunity to start teaching uh, on the Bible, and he begins his teaching on the book of Isaiah. Um, so, as Kareem mentioned, I'm working on uh, the Reformation commentary series on Isaiah, and Akko and Patis is getting a lot of uh, a lot of traction. This, he's he's the first Protestant to publish a commentary on the book of Isaiah. Um, Luther gets word of his teaching on Isaiah and uh, sends him encouragement, sends him affirmation. Erasmus isn't so happy about some of the things that Akko and Patis is teaching at the time, um, but Luther hears about this. People are asking for his notes before. It become, before it's getting published. Um, so Aquilum Patius, even some of his lectures sometimes have up to 400 people attending them. Um, not just students and other pastors, but people from the public are going and listening to him because he's not just teaching in Latin, which would have been typical, but he's also teaching in German as well. And so people are understanding what he's saying uh, on Isaiah. So this commentary gets published in 1525. Um, he's, he was not yet a professor at that time, but because of the, the reception of these lectures, he actually uh, is asked to, to become a professor of theology at the University of Basel. He continues his preaching ministry as well. So he's got this uh, great combination of preaching in the classroom, or teaching in the classroom and preaching in the pulpit. Uh, at the age of 45, he gets married to Wibrandis Rosenblatt, who also has an incredible story of her own. Um, she ends up actually marrying four different reformers. Um, who, and she's widowed three times. Um, with Brandis, Aquampadius marries her. Uh, he's her second husband. Um, and again, this is one of those actions that is somewhat of also a defiance to the Roman Catholic Church because he's a priest and he was in a monastery. He should have remained celibate. Instead, he gets married as, as I'm, I'm sure there was love involved as well, but as a way of defying the, the Roman Catholic Church as well. Um, he becomes very important in the debates over the Lord's Supper. He's one of the key figures at the Marburg Colloquy in 1529, the debates between Luther and, and Zwingli that uh, they agree on 14 things but uh, can't agree together on the final uh, part of the, the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. He becomes the, the leader of the Reformation in Basel. He's kind of the head figure even though, um, like many of the other places, the Reformation also has a uh, ground up taking of the, the people are also very involved in the Reformation taking place in Basel. So from 1522 to 1531, he's preaching and teaching, and most of his um, works, his, comment, his, his teaching, his lectures, and his sermons, a lot of them get eventually published as commentaries. Um, he has 16 published commentaries in 39 different editions. Um, and these cover at least sections of 23 books of the Bible. Uh, ten of these are published after his death, um, but this shows there's a, a great uh, traction in the teaching that he has and that people are utilizing these commentaries. And that's a lot of the work that I've done is looking at what he says in certain texts and certain passages and how others have either developed that, quoted from it, used it, or changed it. Uh, so, as I noted, um, Aquilum Patius actually dies November 1531, just two weeks after Zwingli dies. And um, there's some interesting theories about his, uh, how he died. I mean, again, we don't have uh, strong evidence of it, um, but, but some related to he's, he's uh, very sorrowful because of Zwingli's death. Um, and he just cannot go on. He also gets sick at the time. But, so 1531, 
Um, he's only like 49 years old then when he dies. So his contribution is really in this very short, about eight to nine year window of time, um, and it carries on for quite a while. So all of that to set up for what I've called his Christoscopic reading of scripture. There's the, the book um, that uh, Karine mentioned here. Um, what do I mean by a Christoscopic reading of scripture? Um, of the few scholars who have written on Aquilampadius, and or especially about his biblical commentaries or his interpretation, they note that uh, he has a Christocentric or a Christological take. Um, what I've done is look at there's more to it than that, and there's a theme that consistently shows up in his writings, particularly like in the preface to Isaiah. Um, I'll note it in the Hebrews, some of the Hebrews passages as well, in Ezekiel, in the Minor Prophets. He uses this idea that Christ is the scopus of all of Scripture, where Christ is the goal, when we translate this into English, Christ is the goal of Scripture, and that every Scripture, in some way, aims toward Christ as the goal. Um, he, he really, and I, I developed this more in the book, he really adopts this from an Eastern notion, particularly in Cyril of Alexandria, of the idea of scopos, um, that there, or a theologically literal view, um, that instead of having the fourfold view of scripture, the, that's sometimes called the quadriga, that was prominent in the Middle Ages, um, has the, the literal historical, the allegorical, um, the tropological, and the moral, these, the Eastern people held to more of a twofold view of a literal, I mean a literary view and a spiritual sense. Um, and so it was more of a twofold one, and they use this language of scopos to talk about what the spiritual goal is. Um, Cyril of Alexandria uses this language of the history and the mystery, and that shows up repeatedly in, uh, in Akko and Pontius' work as well. So this is from his commentary on Isaiah. Uh, you see this, the very first one, for every scripture looks to Christ as its goal, in the Latin there, scopum. And then as he explains this a little bit farther in that passage, remember the histories of the times of the prophets, for unless they were rightly laid before as a foundation, whatever was built on top will ruin it. And so that's kind of a, a reference to this idea of the fourfold scripture. Um, if you're just building these things on top, but there's no actual historical foundation, you're just making up things. In the same way also, if rightly handled, they, these histories, will also happily be able to acquire the mysteries of allegories which you should be aware that you do not entirely despise, but also not advance unreasonably. Um, and so what I've done is note that this histories and mysteries approach, um, what Dr. Lampadius does in talking about allegories is not just coming up with, you know, this, everything that's read refers to the blood of Christ, but that he wants to make sure that there's a historical foundation and anything that's built on top of it, any sense that comes from that is grounded in that historical foundation. And he primarily does this twofold, history and mystery, and refers to this as the scope of scripture. Um, so this is what I've called his Christoscopic reading or Christoscopic approach to scripture. And in his commentary on Hebrews, uh, he actually, where, especially where he, pri he uh, primarily discusses this idea of the covenant that we're going to look at, uh, he makes one of the most definitive statements about the scope of scripture. Uh, so this is in his Hebrews commentary when he gets to chapter 10, verse 7. For every scripture aims at Christ as the unique pre-established goal, the scope of it. See, I ask, to whom did all the genealogies lead? To whom did so much of the ancient history look? Who did so many and various sacrifices prefigure? In whom also are all the promises fulfilled? And perhaps you will not doubt that everywhere it was written about Christ. And there's several of these kind of interjected in, in many of his commentaries, these statements that the goal of Scripture, every one of them, aims at Christ in some way. Um, and he does lots of different ways of getting there linguistically, thematically, contextually, uh, particularly bringing in other Scripture passages. So what I've done is really looked at his Hebrews uh, commentary uh, to identify what he's teaching about on the covenant. Um, because of its nature, as well as some of the, the questions about the origin of the covenant idea, we'll also look a little bit at his Jeremiah and Isaiah commentaries as well. Um, I want to give just a 
bit of background on his Hebrews lectures. The lectures held in Basel at the university there uh, were in the winter of 1529 to the fall of 1530. Uh, the commentary in this case was published posthumously in 1534 in Strasbourg um, from notes that he had and notes that some of his students had and they compiled them together and did uh, an editing there and they explained some of that in the preface of the book. Um, his comments on Hebrews 8 through 10 in particular include his teachings on the covenant. If you know the book of Hebrews, this is where there's this long argument by the author of Hebrews about Christ as the mediator of the better covenant. Um, some Reformation scholars have identified Acolytius as you know, significantly contributing to the covenant, uh, the covenant idea, the development of it. Uh, they often, you can see here, don't agree with each other. Um, and they often focus on two key issues or two key questions. One is whether or not Acolympanius or whoever they're looking at held to a bilateral or unilateral view of the covenant. And so by unilateral, we mean that God, it's a one-sided, unilateral, one-sided, God alone establishes and maintains the covenant with no obligation from the people. So God is doing everything and there's no condition or obligation for the people to do anything in response. That's the unilateral. The bilateral view is that the covenant is two-sided, where God and his people mutually agree upon the conditions and obligations of the covenant that must continue for it to remain binding. So the bilateral, there's two sides. The unilateral, there's only one side, mainly God. And then the other issue is who is actually the first to come up with the Reformed Covenant idea, and scholars love that kind of work of who's the first. Um, so you see here, Trinerud says Acolampadius is the first, and that Acolampadius held to a bilateral covenant. Cottrell, that Zwingli was first, and Acolampadius held a unilateral cap, uh, view on the covenant. Baker says that Bollinger was first, and Acolampadius held to a unilateral view. Lilbach says it might be Acolampadius, um, and he argues Acolampadius held to a bilateral view. Poitras, um, following Wilbeck, says that it might be Aquilampadius, uh, though it's hard to determine. In one of her writings, she concludes that Aquilampadius holds to a unilateral view. In her dissertation, she actually notes that it's hard to classify him. Um, we'll see, following the 16th century writer Polanus, Polanus said that Aquilampadius was actually the founder of the Reformed Covenant idea. Um, and because of the time and the interest of that, that wasn't the, the question of unilateral and bilateral wasn't even addressed. Um, so, because of that disparity, uh, it might be helpful for a little more closer look at what Aquilampadius actually teaches on the covenant, whether it is unilateral, bilateral, um, a little bit of both, and um, if it's even uh, feasible to identify who's the founder of the Reformed Covenant idea. Uh, so that's where I turned to the Hebrews commentary and looked at uh, some of these uh, some of the, the actual comments that the Acolampadius makes. None of these scholars who are listed up there engage with Acolampadius' commentary on Hebrews. As I noted, it's 1534 when it's published, so it doesn't really help address the answer of who was first, because this has already been developed by the time uh, the, the Hebrews uh, commentary gets published. Instead, they often look at the Isaiah commentary or the Jeremiah commentary, um, although Aaron Stalon, who uh, has the definitive biography and a lot of the primary source work on Aquilampadius warns that the Jeremiah commentary might not be all that reliable for what Aquilampadius actually taught um, because some of the editors, uh, particularly Wolfgang Capito, interjected some of his own ideas into the, the commentary and freely edited in some of the work that was in there. But the editors of the Hebrews commentary actually refer to the Jeremiah commentary when it's on the covenant and say, if you want to know more about this, go read Acolampadius' Jeremiah commentary, particularly on uh, chapter 31 of Jeremiah. So, in this case, Acolampadius, uh, his comments on the covenants in both Hebrews and Jeremiah and Isaiah are quite consistent. Um, so the Jeremiah lectures were in 1526, 1527. Um, and that one was published a couple years later during, uh, or right after, that one also is posthumously right after Acolampadius' death. All right, so what do we find about the covenant in this Hebrews commentary? Um, like others before him, Acolampadius uses the words testamentum, fetus, pactum, uh, all to refer to covenant, and then he's got some explanation about some of those. 
um, but usually it's used interchangeably to refer to the covenant. Uh, he actually specifies the nature of a covenant, and this is the quote I have here. It is characteristic for covenants to be ratified that first, there are two parties. Then they specify and accept certain fixed conditions or laws on both sides. When that is done, then generally, you have an established covenant. Here, those conditions were, God says, I will be your God and protector, and the people say from the other side, I will be your people and obedient to what is said according to all the words of the law. And so finally, with the conditions adopted, the covenant is confirmed by some sacrifice or other specific ceremonies. Uh, so if you're keeping score on this, this sounds quite bilateral. There's two parties, two involved, they each agree to the conditions, and so the scholars like Baker who say that it's not bilateral, well, it doesn't take much investigation into Hebrews to see that Akko and Padius has actually already explained this, that the covenant in general and the covenant between God and his people is bilateral, a conditional and mutual agreement between two parties. Uh, and so Baker, for example, says that nowhere does Akko and Padius say that there's a bilateral nature of the covenant when, in fact, it's, it's right there in his commentary. Um, his comments, Akalampanius' comments, also demonstrate the inaccuracy of Baker's assertion that Akalampanius didn't see the unity between the two testaments, the Old and the New Testament, but held to a two-covenant scheme uh, of the law in the Old Testament and the Gospel in the New Testament. Um, while Akalampanius does use that language and affirm that the Gospel was opposed to the law, he insisted that we had to see how the author of Hebrews, in this case, opposed the gospel to the law, and how the law was abolished, and how it was not abolished. Um, so Baker utilized uh, the comments from Jeremiah uh, to try to argue that Apollonius um, held to this twofold covenant, and there was a, a strong distinction. Uh, and so these words are there in the Jeremiah commentary, but we find a twofold covenant: old and new, carnal and spiritual, external and internal perfect and imperfect. This one which God formerly entered into with the people, since it was carnal, it was imperfect, old and shadowy, taking them by the hand but not leading them to perfection, it was therefore also going to be abolished. So when you hear words like that, it sounds like, oh yeah, Old Testament, New Testament, there's discontinuity there, one's old and it's going away, one's new and it's replacing it. But then we also have, just a few sentences later in that Jeremiah commentary, according to God, there is one covenant that is eternal, which was variously ordained for the different times. Um, and so Akhil and Pai specified that any of these specific covenants uh, with Abraham, with Moses, and leading into Christ, all of them were part of the one eternal covenant, which was always the same in substance, but had different methods and different provisions. Um, and so this view differs from the inherited medieval tradition. Um, the most influential views in the medieval tradition were Jerome, and Augustine, Jerome taught that the two covenants essentially contrast with one another in terms of time, uh, this old era, new era, and that the old covenant was completely displaced by the new covenant in the era of the spirit, and the old covenant was the era of the law. Augustine, on the other hand, or Augustine, depending on how you want to say, uh, recognized more continuity between the two uh, time periods, between the two covenants, by articulating that the, the, the contrast was in terms of a person's salvation or standing before God and not in the sense of the era in which they lived. And so later medieval theologians, uh, later interpreters will, will use some of Jerome, some of Augustine, um, and but really emphasize this discontinuity between the old covenant and the new covenant in terms of time. Um, and Chrysostom, for example, said that the old covenant is uh, one era uh, and the New Covenant, you, he uses this illustration of, you wouldn't just you know, fix some of the painting on a, a rusty old house and say, oh, it's new, but it has to be something brand new. And so Chrysostom is one who also emphasizes this contrast between the old and the new. Uh, in general, the medieval exegetes and their comments on Hebrews in particular emphasize the significant differences between the two covenants, the old and the new, and the time of grace and the time of law. Uh, Luther, as some of you may know, more closely follows Aquinas and Augustine um, with his familiar um, contrast between the Old and the New Covenants in this law and gospel. Doing the same kind of thing, a similar thing, 
that the, the New Testament, what, uh, the, the law is how you receive it, no matter whether you're in the new era or the old era, if you receive it as law, then you're under law. If you receive it as spirit, then it's under the grace and under the new covenant. Um, Akalampadius uses some of that language, but his view is quite a bit different. Um, Akalampadius actually repeatedly affirmed, uh-oh, it's, it's, it's going to restart here. Akalampadius. Try the box at the top and see if you want to make it disappear. We'll just push the box down there. We'll just throw it off the screen. Um, so one of the key themes that we see in Akhilapanis' view of the covenant, as this quote shows, is that the Old Testament saints were included in the new covenant. So he does not do this distinguish between eras. Um, but those who are pious before the coming of Christ, such as Abel, Noah, Abraham, and others, were included in the covenant when they pleased God, which could not happen unless they had participated in his spirit and had also been led by him as sons of God. Nevertheless, at that time, this covenant was not yet revealed as the fullness of time had not yet arrived. Uh, interestingly, he also he uses um, the inclusion of the saints in the Old Testament as uh, a parallel with the inclusion of children in the New Covenant. Um, that he uses the illustration of like newborn puppies they aren't, we don't say they're blind because they're born without the ability to see, but that they do not yet see. And so, like children who do not yet, have not yet professed faith in Jesus, they have, God knows that they've been elected from before the foundation of the world, is Sacrifice's argument. God knows it, and so one day they will see, and like a newborn puppy who will see, we don't say he was blind, um, the Old Testament saints are like that, in that they also... Uh, would one day be, uh, be the, the revelation would be clear and that they would be part of this new covenant. Um, Aklampadius gave several reasons why he called, why he would call the new covenant new. Let's not, let me, there we go. Um, and this is the quote I want to highlight for this. Further, it is not called new for the reason that the thing itself is a new and different covenant in substance from what is prior, which truly was always the same, but it's enacted by a certain new way and method. For formerly he, God, chose and took some to himself from one people, the Hebrews, now truly from all the peoples of the earth, that is, from all the nations. Then he granted those whom he took formerly a weaker spirit, and so he bound them with many ceremonies. But now he gives his people the greatest spirit and obligates them to the fewest ceremonies. And that is the difference between us and those who believe before Christ. And so Akhil and Pius, uh, we can summarize his aspects of what makes the New Covenant new with these four ideas. Um, the New Covenant included people from all nations, not just Israel. It provided a greater outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Um, they, would, they did not have the need for ceremonies to be observed because they had been fulfilled in Christ. And it was ratified between the people and God by the blood of Christ as that one sacrifice. Um, Aklampadius' primary emphasis is on the work of the Holy Spirit. And that that's the key aspect of what makes uh, this covenant new. Formerly, the laws were inscribed on tablets of stone. Now I'm going to get shut out. Oh, um, hang on. Deborah, do you want a word, Deborah? Why don't you come in? Yeah, yeah. If, you, if we need it, show me. Wait, okay. Yeah. Um, formerly, they were inscribed on tablets of stone. Now God inscribes <clears throat> them in the flesh and makes their hearts and inmost parts. And indeed, by his spirit, he makes it so that all of their actions and thoughts are inclined to his will. And so you see that to impart the law in the mind and to inscribe the law in the heart is nothing other than to give the Holy Spirit, who regenerates, changes, and renews hearts, so that now divine things, which were previously abhorring, may be pleasing. When we receive this spirit, the eternal covenant will be established between us and God. And again, I have other quotes here. Uh, that demonstrate that the Spirit, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit and His ability to, and His action to regenerate is what is key to Apollonius' view on what makes the New Covenant new. Um, he notes that, the, the, again going back to the bilateral idea, um, that what made the covenant, the Old Covenant fail was not because the Old Covenant was bad, but because the people actually failed. The people failed to keep their side of the promise and so they became covenant breakers, which meant that God was also not obligated to keep his side of the covenant, but yet God did, and particularly did in sending his spirit. 
Um, so again, this emphasis on the Spirit uh, is particular to the New Testament or covenant that God forgives our sins and regenerates us to new life by His Spirit. And then regarding the uh, Old Testament saints, what pertains to piety and the Spirit remains one and the same in every age. And whatever positive thing that people in the Old Covenant and the Old Testament did, uh, the work has to be completed by the Spirit. Um, so that he maintained over and over repeatedly throughout, um, and you see that from the Jeremiah as well as the Hebrews, that the presence of the Spirit and the work of the Spirit is what makes the New Covenant new. Um, Akko and Pati's presented the covenant as both God's one eternal promise and as a conditional arrangement with the new way containing the conditions of the covenant in the promise. So God makes this promise, this covenant promise, and the new covenant, what it has is that the way to, for the people to fulfill the covenant, their side of the covenant obligations, is also provided in the covenant. In that way is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enables them to be able to fulfill their side of the covenant. Um, and Akhil and reason that the saints in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, um, would have had and been enabled by the Spirit to do the same thing, and that now we see these things more clearly in the time of the New Testament. Um, it's fascinating then, and illuminating, uh, though that I'll keep this uh, somewhat uh, concise. It's fascinating and illuminating to compare this to some of these other reformers at the time. Um, so that before we enter into that, here's my summary of Akko and The covenant is both God's one eternal promise and a conditional arrangement with this new way containing the conditions of the covenant in the promise, fulfilled by Christ and then enabled by the Spirit. Uh, so the other, in the other re reformers that I looked at are Bollinger and Zwingli. Um, most notably, at the time, the timing of this is fascinating because Zwingli and Bollinger also publish Hebrews commentaries, but when they're teaching and when the delay between teaching and publication, none of them get to actually use one another's published works. So doing like who borrowed from who, we can't really identify, um, but they're all coming up to, very, coming with very similar conclusions, um, though there are some significant differences between them. Um, because Bollinger's annotations on Hebrews are quite brief, um, the comparisons only reveal some degree of similarity and contrast. Um, another one that I looked at is Conrad Pelican. Uh, in today's world, Pelican would have been cited for plagiarism uh, because he mostly just takes Occlumpadius' wor words word for word and puts them in his own commentary, especially in this section on the covenant. Uh, much of Pelican's comments are exactly the same as what's in Aklampanis, with the exception of some Greek and Hebrew and references to other passages. Uh, but like Aklampanis, Pelican, Bollinger, Zwingli emphasized the unity and the continuity between with the one eternal covenant, um, while noting some particular discontinuities, especially related to the law and the sacrifices. They affirmed that there was only one covenant, originally made with, Ad with Adam, renewed with Noah, clarified with Abraham, and fulfilled in Christ. Uh, they also agreed there had only ever been one church, composed of both Old Testament saints and Christians, and they concluded that baptism was the sign of the new covenant, just as circumcision had been the sign of the old covenant. Uh, Bollinger and Zwingli echoed Echolampadius' view that the apostle used the word testament uh, to show that it requires the death of the testator. Um, as is found in common human custom, they noted. Uh, they both emphasized that this showed that Christ had to die. Nacolampadius, on the other hand, actually emphasized this testature or testament language as showing the certainty of the, and the unchangeable nature of the new covenant. Um, Bollinger and Nacolampadius communicate a bilateral nature of the covenant more strongly than Zwingli. Um, Bollinger also uh, cites and explains Jeremiah 31 in a very similar way to Akhil and Padius. Um, they all emphasize that the sacrifices were weak and useless and going to be abolished, and that the one-time sacrifice of Christ put an end to the Levitical priesthood. Um, they all also affirm that not the entire law was abolished, but only those that were related to the priesthood and sacrifices. Um, so another uh, important person that we need to mention here is John Calvin, right? Uh, so I'll finish with Calvin. 
Uh, Lilbeck points out that Calvin was obviously not the initiator or the designer of um, the uh, covenant theology, the Reformed view on covenant, uh, but he was the first of the earliest theologians to integrate the covenant concept extensively into his theological system. And he helpfully provides uh, kind of a summary here of Calvin's view on the covenant uh, with five key themes. First of all, uh, the more abundant power of the Spirit. Secondly, a more abundant mercy for forgiveness. Third, more clarity of the promises with respect to salvation. Fourth, different spiritual gifts specific to the gospel age. And fifth, the extension of the promise to all the nations rather than just one people. Uh, and with the exception of uh, number four there, the different spiritual gifts specific to the gospel age, all of these are the ones that Akhilampadis, the key themes that Akhilampadis emphasized, uh, that a couple of them uh, are not as pronounced in Zwingli and Bollinger. Zwingli and Bollinger particularly emphasized that what was new in the New Covenant was the forgiveness of sins by the blood of Christ. Um, Calvin actually repeats some of the logic of Aquilampadius that when the fathers were under the old law and they worshiped God and followed his commandments, it, quote, could not have been unless they had been inwardly taught by the Spirit. Uh, likewise, while Bollinger and Zwingli only specified in their Hebrews commentaries that the substance of the, of the covenant is the forgiveness of sins, both Calvin and Apocalyptus uh, included the spiritual regeneration in their articulation of the new covenant. Uh, Calvin taught that the new covenant consists of free remission of sins and the inward renewing of the heart by the Spirit. Uh, again, both Calvin and Apocalyptus also emphasized the work of adoption in the New Covenant that Bollinger and Zwingli do not uh, specify as part of what is true in the New Covenant. So there's substantial agreement between Calvin and Aquilampadius, obviously as true with Calvin in many things. Uh, there are also some areas of disagreement. Um, he has a different explanation about testament uh, and the death of Christ as, as solidifying that. Um, but Wolsey, who I noted at the beginning here, argues also in his study on the Reformed tradition the Aquilampadius' view that I noted here, the conditions of the covenant were themselves contained in the promise of the covenant, was exactly what was in Usher, Ball, and the Westminster Confession of Faith. So Aquilampadius has a highly developed uh, understanding of the Reformed idea of the covenant. It's in Jeremiah, and Isaiah, and Hebrews uh, over a seven-year span. Um, it's picked up by Calvin and others in the Reformed tradition. And especially what I've noted is the unique pieces that are in Aquilampadius that are not in Bollinger and Zwingli get developed by Calvin and then picked up later in the Western in the Westminster Confession and others in the Reformed tradition. So because Aquilampadius notes Christ is the goal of all scripture, the entire movement of God's promises from Genesis through Revelation leads us to see this as one eternal covenant where God is fulfilling his own promises and enabling us to meet the obligations of that covenant. This is Aquilampadius' Christoscopic view of the covenant. Thank you. We did it without the computer deciding it. I know. We made it. Yeah. That's right. incredible. All right. So now oh, we have there it goes. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, all right. Time for questions. Time for discussion. Um, I find it fascinating how little airtime someone like Agalampadius has gotten. Yeah. And I mean, obviously in an English language world, he doesn't get much attention because he's not available much in English, but among German speaking scholars, not much interest, not do you have any either. idea why? I have some speculation. Uh -huh. um, one is now you really, you need to understand Hebrew, Greek, German, and Latin. Yeah. If you don't have those four languages, some of the comments that he makes, if you don't know Hebrew, you don't understand the argumentation that he's making there. Um, so yeah, that, that's a, that presents a challenge right there. Um, I also have the speculation that he was much more mild-mannered, much more um, like kind of like Melanchthon, trying to keep the peace and having this kind of uh, gentleness among him. So we don't hear as much about like Zwingli and Luther. Right. They get a lot of traction afterwards because they're flamboyant and loud and brass. And so mm -hmm. I think he just kind of faded away. Mm -hmm. um, so it, yeah, it's interesting that even after like the 17th century, um, you don't hear that much about him. Yeah, absolutely.
even though up to that time, it's he's he's getting mentioned all the time. I mean, people are like Calvin are, are especially using it. So I, I would also say that's another piece of it that once a lot of his stuff gets brought into Calvin, there isn't a need to go back to Aquinas. Interesting. People figure we got Calvin. We got Calvin. So we why do we need to go to find out where he got this stuff from? Mm -hmm. <coughs> all right. Other questions? Other points people want to raise? Questions? Insights? Yeah, um, question. It just seems to me, uh, Akul, that, how yeah, say? Yeah, Akul Mpani, yeah, 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 lamp guy. He just understand the covenant theology, have two dimensions. One is the bilateral, mm -hmm. and another is unilateral. Yeah. But to me, by your lecture, it seems to me that the bilateral just based on the historical, Dimension and the unilateral as more related to mysterious. Yeah, so I mean, I think your point's well taken that in the like the the living out of redemptive history, it's a bilateral covenant, but then you have a unilateral covenant from like God's perspective. Like God has been doing this unilaterally the whole time, but as people are living it out, it is bilateral. So, I mean, I think that's why some of these other scholars are like, well, he doesn't really fit neatly into either one of these categories. I would also have been argue, well, I don't know that Bollinger, Zwingli, and Calvin do either. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, the reformed understanding of the covenant idea, there is both of those things. This bilateral, there are conditions, but God is working to meet those conditions on our behalf because he knows we're not going to do it ourselves. Yeah. Yes, Brian. In his development of this uh, the beginnings here of this reform concept of a covenant, is he responding to and, and reacting to some of the Anabaptist theology? Is that driving? It doesn't drive it initially because some of that is going it, it is coming. I mean, what I've looked at is primarily his commentaries. Um, so he's really just working on explaining what's going on in these biblical texts. Um, I don't, as far as I know, he doesn't have like a treatise or anything against like the Anabaptists. On that include this kind of thing. Yeah. One of the fascinating things, um, it was raised at the uh, Swiss Reformation celebration, Amy Nelson Burnett noted, um, where covenant, the covenant baptism idea, who's the first, who starts that, um, particularly in response to, or an explanation against the Anabaptists. Um, I, there's, there's pieces of this where he holds this covenant view. I mentioned the thing about including children in the covenant. Um, baptism is the sign of the covenant. But what I have not yet found is this kind of explanation of baptism as the, what we talk about is covenant baptism as uh, including these children, like a, a defense of infant baptism kind of thing either. So that's, that's a, a project that's in the back of my mind of what I still want to explore a little bit more. Yes, sir. I had kind of the same question, but from the point of view of Roman Catholic thinkers yeah. at the time. Yeah. I'm getting the impression that he wasn't much into polemics and saying, no, you're wrong, I'm right. Would just he like to sit and read scripture and say what it means? Yeah, um, you're right that he doesn't do a lot of polemics against the Roman Catholic Church, and especially in his commentary, so that's another piece in, in the book, in the book I wrote for my dissertation, um, that there's a lot of bashing of the Mass in Roman Catholics and all that kind of stuff. His is much more tempered than someone like Bollinger or Zwingli. Um, so in, the, in these areas, he's not really going against a Roman Catholic view as much as just kind of the inherited view of this discontinuity between the two covenants, the old era and the new era. And the new era is so much superior to the old era. Other questions? Well. Thank you very much. This has been fascinating. Um, I have a couple questions. First of all, um, how does Eklampadius move from Luther to into the reform camp? I mean, initially he said he was attracted to Luther, he was invited to right. Wittenberg, right. but by 1529 he's at the Marburg Colloquy on the right. other side of the table. Right. Right. How does how does that work? I, I think it's really his re, his finally his third return to Basel and his friendship with Zwingli that he really gets he gets. No matter, uh, I think it's Gugusberg that usually gets caught into Zwingli's orbit. Um, that he really he's, his connections there. Or what keep him in the reformed camp? Uh, is it over the 
Dr. the Lord's Supper then? I mean, he's more not initially, to... not initially. Yeah. So he'll write the, the treatises in 1524 and 1525 on the on the Lord's Supper. Particularly, he's in, in correspondence with Melanchthon. They're the two people who are writing about the use of the church fathers and who understands this right. Melanchthon's more the, the author for the Lutheran view, and Aquinas is the one writing for the Reformed view. But that's a few years later, after he's already starting to be established in Basel. And then he'll show up at the colloquy and be the, the representative doctor there um, for the, the Swiss side. So does he see himself as consciously moving from kind of a Lutheran orbit into a more Reformed orbit? At some point, I think or? only over the Lord's Supper. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I mean, he, otherwise he'd have a lot of. I mean, and he, he's. Uh, there's another article I've written on uh, his friendship with Melanchthon and the breakdown of the friendship they have. They remain very good friends, and they're corresponding with one another. Um, but then both of them have like these periods of silence, and they're like, "Why are you not writing to me anymore?" And it's over the Lord's Supper stuff, um, and so. That's where you see some of that movement away from uh, affiliating with Luther and the Lutheran, who will agree with all the Lutherans. Did Apollon have anything to say about the use of images in worship? Because that's another touch point in um, the debate. He did. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'd have to dig deeper back into what, what he actually said. That's one of the ones that's very mm -hmm. clearly demarcating the yeah. differences between Lutheran and Reformed folk. Yeah. Is what do they do with all the images? Right. Right. Do we smash them all? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And at a popular level, that's a big right. deal. Right. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, hang on. We'll do one here and then we'll go back. Yes. Um, is there any differences between to say the Christ copy and Christ center? <laughs> it reminds me of the Brian Chapel's Christ center. So right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, for the time period, there is a, like, Luther often gets called as having a Christocentric. Uh, reading of scripture, Christocentric, hermeneutic. Aquilampadius is a bit different. Uh, I, I picked the scopic to, because of this emphasis he has on Christ is the goal of all scripture, so that you're not necessarily trying to find Christ in a text, um, but that a text could be something that's actually just setting you up for a trajectory or a later thing, um, so that it, it's, it's pointing ahead, not necessarily that this is, rep this is representing Christ. So that's a bit of the, the difference. Um, I mean, one of the earlier chapters in Hebrews, Aquilampadius is one of the earliest people to do the whole, is the author of the New Testament using the Old Testament quotes properly? Most people were like, well, the Spirit inspired him, and he's got to be using it properly. They didn't try to explain how. Aquilampadius does that with all of the quotes early on in the book of Hebrews. He's explaining why the apostle was right to use the, the Old Testament quotes in these particular ways. Um, and, and some of that points to this, well, because it's leading on this trajectory to Christ, it's not that it's necessarily talking about Christ himself in that time. Yeah? Another question over here? This is a really interesting point. I, I have a different kind of question. You said he lectured in German Yeah. also. Was there yeah. a standard German? I thought people had to lecture in Latin in those days because they moved around a lot of different places. Yeah. Was there a standard German that was understood in Basel? I believe so, yes. Um, so his lectures actually were, he'd do some in Latin and then he'd go to German, or he'd do some German and then go to Latin, and so he would go back and forth in this language. Um, he didn't do it for all the lectures, yes. but especially on the Isaiah ones initially, he was including that back and forth kind of thing. Yeah, I was just wondering whether there was something like right. high German a, a dialect that, yeah. I mean, the Swiss yeah. lands have dialects. Right. Their right. version of exactly. German is very dialect. It's a right. very strong dialect. Yeah, right? exactly. They don't necessarily understand each other across different areas. And that's why I'm surprised he could lecture in German. Yeah. For his own people, For his, yeah. in his own town, they yeah. would have understood uh, him. And it was certainly Zwingli right. and his colleagues did the same in Zurich, right, with the prophesy, which was their sort of Bible study for pastors. It would start in Latin yeah. and finish yeah. in the vernacular. Yeah. Because the idea was that the citizens would come and listen to the last part and get edified by the explanation of the Word of God and done in their own language. Yeah. All right, please join me in thanking our speaker for today's presentation. <laughs> I will give you a heads up for quite a while down the road, and that is that we have been holding...